The return to democratic governance in 1999 saw the military taking a withdrawal to see to improved professionalism in the actualization of its constitutional mandate. Now, it worked out several reforms in line with desired national goals in mind. One of such is the establishment of the Nigerian Army Resource Center, NARC, on 20th November 2015, serving to bring on personnel professional improvements. How on track is the vision till date? Have a guest on the spot, competent and ready to speak to these and more on the program. Welcome. My name is Blessing Abu. My guest was born on the 27th of August 1958 in the Loring State. He is a graduate of political science from the University of Lagos, and he also has a master's degree in defense studies and international relations from King's College in London. My guest was commissioned as lieutenant into the Nigerian Army Corps of Military Police in December 1983. He also served in the Nigerian Army as a provost officer, he rose to become principal staff officer to the chief of army staff, director of operations army headquarters, general officer commanding at the uh, GOC-1 Infantry Division, Kaduna, and also chief of administration at army headquarters before he retired from active service on the 28th of January 2015. My guests was appointed on the 11th of March, 2019, the Director General, Nigerian Army Resource Center. Welcome to the program, Major General Garaba Ayodeji Wahab. Welcome, sir. Thank you very much. Yes, for a center so huge, the military must have thought something worth the while to actually look back and put themselves on the front burner to see how to work, them, work it out on a full scale. Yeah. Tell us about this vision and how it has worked so far. Well, the Nigerian Army Resource Center was established principally to examine defense and security matters facing the system and by implication the nation and to be a research establishment of global repute. Yeah. And uh, we've tried as much as possible well to achieve that mission within the constraints we have. Mm -hmm. And in doing that, we've not only conducted researches, but we also train because some recommendations were passed back to Army headquarters. Mm -hmm. And it was realized that, look, it will be necessary to train people appropriately mm -hmm. to be able to achieve the recommendations. Mm -hmm. So we do two things right now. We, do, we conduct researches into various fields. We train. And in doing our researches, we also invite people from different parts of the world and the nation to come and give lectures. We have what is called a monthly lecture series. Okay. So is this strictly just for military personnel or you're looking into other resources from across, um, outside your military purview? It's, it's open. The center is open. Actually, membership of the center is open to the general public. Mm -hmm. And the resource people we invite are not usually military personnel. Okay. We look for experts from in different fields from different parts of the world okay. and we invite them to come and talk to us. Did you at any point go through any course there or training or presentation at the center? No. It was not it was it was not it was not it was after I've left that it came on board. Okay. And uh, it was based on the realization that look, you can't keep on asking those who are in on active service to be thinking, to be researching into the problems they are facing. You won't get the best. Why globally, so? globally, you allow those who are serving to keep on doing their job and those who have had similar experiences to come back and think out the problems and critically. I can tell the show of Army staff what you are doing is not right. A serving officer cannot do that. Which is one problem that I think um, well, well, I don't know if it's just within the military or generally outside. For serving officers, being able to speak up for what they are facing, it has to take, okay, some of the officers, uh, whether Army, um, Navy, Air Force, to be out of the system before they voice out. No, it's, it's not that you cannot speak. There are things, for instance, uh, when the current protest started, 
Uh, the center wrote a report. We have some subject experts, 10 of them, looking at different parts of the world. Mm. And twice a week, Mondays and Fridays, we meet and we go through events globally. And the person covering Southeast Asia talked about the protests in Thailand, the protests in Malaysia, and drew a nexus with what might likely be happening in Nigeria. I'm glad you've already pointed out what will have still be part of our discussion. Mm issue of protests mm. and um, when it um, escalates beyond what the regular law enforcement agent can actually now we say because it's democratic uh, regime mm. it's the police that will have the first hand um, uh, front with the, with the protesters or the, uh, or the, uh, the citizens mm. and at a point once it gets beyond what they can actually contain most likely we have the military or the army being brought in what defines internal security beyond what we know it that constitutes a threat or that bring about insecurity for, from what you've just uh, raised about what we have presently protested? The, the military does not just go into an operation. Uh, there, there are various processes and procedures that are involved. And you go through those processes and procedures before they, they come in. And the final uh, step will be by the president to actually call out the military based on the, on the Constitution. The Constitution, Section 218, provides for the President to utilize the military operationally, whichever way it feels, but with the consent of the National Assembly. Okay. So the military does not come in. You have to look at those who are involved, the type of weapon they are using, and the aim and objective, and the effect on the citizenry. If it's getting to a level that the police cannot contend again, there are processes by which they will say, look, we can't contain this again. So a lot of things will have been happening. A message will have been going from the grassroots, from the local government to the state. The state governors will have been talking to the president, the military chain of command, the police chain of command, the other agency chain of command. Everybody will have been talking and relating. And until a point, we get to a point where they believe is, this cannot be contained by the civil police and other paramilitary security agencies again. And then a formal uh, declaration is made before the military comes in. Mm -hmm. And even while the military is on, it is not that the other agencies will go away. They are still there. Mm -hmm. And back to the initial court, it is not that a serving or second talk. There are processes and procedures, there are, there are uh, uh, platforms provided for it. But for instance, if something has to do with the government, a serving officer cannot go and meet the show officer and say, please, don't do this because you need to advise the government to do so, so, and so. You cannot do that. But it's I'm, a question of obey the last uh, order. Yes, it, it borders on loyalty and how far you can go about what you can tell. Anywhere in the world, that's the rule. Okay, let, let's, get, let's get back to the center. Mm. I know it, it has its mission yeah. and there is the vision. Mm. Let's take a look at beyond it being the uh, think tank for for the army uh, or the military generally. Now, your sole aim is also to to further the interest and knowledge of the art, science, mm -hmm. and literature of the defense services. Mm -hmm. Tell us about that. Uh, when you deal with human beings, you are both uh, a scientist and an art person, and that is why in the military you are you are trained perpetually on the issue of how you deal with people, how you deal with your weapons, how you deal with your equipment. But then, you are holding all those things. You are, whatever you do, you are doing it in trust for the people. So you must understand how far you can go. What are the capabilities you need to use when you go outside and when you do whatever you do within. So it's a combination of uh, humanities, arts and science combined, and so you must understand what you do. If you don't, you have a problem. Above all, the military trains everybody to be a leader at any point in time. So leadership is stressed so that at any point, wherever you are, whatever you are, you have some equipment, you have human beings, you are, you are dealing with people. And so you must be able to relay with them appropriately. And you're dealing with nature. Yeah. I see that your light face lit up while talking about this. <laughs> that shows you a lover of art, you're a lover mm. of uh, science, definitely. Mm. You're a lover of nature. Mm. Because nature, of course, involves the human mm -hmm. beings that you'll be dealing with mm -hmm. or you'll be interacting with right. as a military uh, personnel. Mm -hmm. And also, it gives back what you give to it. Yeah.
Let me take you outside the resource center. Mm. And of course, you still your operations. Mm. Over time, we've seen, especially in the last one uh, de uh, decade, um, the military, army, and others, of course, have had to contend with insurgency, and this has made so many of the men edgy. Well, edgy, that is the way we say them. And then, um, of course, in fighting a, a long, prolonged war, mm. they've had to contend with uh, elements, they've had to contend with also the human elements, and also to still be themselves at the right time without breaking, uh, breaking apart. How is the center helping to realize the dreams of keeping the nation secured and also to still keep the men intact? We conduct uh, conferences, seminars, workshops, and, and, and roundtables periodically. And I'll give an example. In November last year, we had a seminar in conjunction with NIM Foundation, which was sponsored by the Swiss Embassy. Again, so last month, we had another one with the University of Ibadan. Actually, the University of Ibadan was commissioned by an American organization and paid for. But once they finished their report, we had a collaboration with the University of Ibadan. So we, we requested for them to come and deliver the findings, the reports, which was based on border security and other pharma clashes. We didn't want them to release the report to the Americans before we know what it is. Because normally, we react in Nigeria. We, we are not proactive. We want things to happen, and then we start looking for answers. So that's part of what we do. And whatever we do, we send the report back, advising or recommending. You need to take A, B, C steps for A, B, C to happen. And we've been doing that. We're calling those who are in the front line. We're calling the commanders and foot soldiers to come and give an account of their experiences. And based on that, we we'll, we'll come up with recommendations as to what the army or the system should do. And usually when we send out our report, it's maybe in about two or three, three, three different dimensions. One, what the government needs to do. Two, what the defense establishment needs to do. And three, what army headquarters and individual soldiers need to do. And so we, and usually, whatever we do, uh, hopefully the, the Army headquarters had actually or usually approved whatever recommendation because it's not based on sentiment, it's not based on uh, my, this is my experience. No, my experience differ. And we believe that no two, no two days, no two situations are the same. But the recommendations are not only generic, but they can be, be used in specific places. Mm -hmm. So we've been able to at least get across, look after the men, look after the equipment, look after the system and get al around the locals for them to be able to support you. Mm. And in that wise, we have what, what we also conduct indigenous languages courses on Hausa, Yoruba, and Igbo. Okay. And the reason is you cannot be involved in internal security operations and you don't understand the language where you are operating. Whatever we do nowadays, what we call the military call the hybrid warfare is what is happening. Hybrid warfare is based on virtually everything, conventional warfare, computer, even this protest is part of hybrid warfare as far as the military is concerned. Okay. All right. We'll be going on a break now okay. for you to take some breathers. Mm -hmm. And um, when we return, what other recommendations have come for NARC in the course of your uh, leadership? That's uh, one year uh, plus now. And what's more, we'll need to do differently to make your job easier and to have national security. We'll be finding out from you after this break. You're watching on the spot. We'll be right back after this break. Okay, welcome back. If you just tuned in, the program is on the spot. And my guest, the Director General of the uh, Nigerian Army Resource Center, is still on the spot. Okay, DG, sir. In 2017, I know you, you had not been appointed then, and then you said you had uh, 
not uh, had the privilege of having any training there, particularly at that center. There was a course, Leadership in National Security, uh, and um, it bordered on an issue of concern not only to the military and other security agencies, but for everyone. So that is uh, to create a synergy uh, as well as um, take a look at national security challenges. There are several. The recent, of course, is a protest by youth to say, OK, no, enough is enough. And um, just saying enough is enough over the brutality from the Nigerian police now, we know the citizens still have had to confront the military, even though they might not have been so confrontational because <laughs> they know they've they gone from the military. Well, I wouldn't want to say maybe it's different in any way. <laughs> ammunition is ammunition. But then when the military want to get into a particular operation, yes, sometimes we get to see the same signals, okay, so, so yeah, we're going to be having operation this or operation that. I don't want to be mentioning names because of um, particular locations are different. But then, already, I know you already started talking about that in the first instance, your first um, uh, response to the first question I put to you about when the military can come out. Now, synergy between the military and those of us on the civilian lane. Over the years, we could say, okay, it's just been here and there. But to have an established great relationship that will help everyone be part of the security architecture, how do you think we can actually improve on that? One of the responsibilities given to the center is just this. Mm. It gets as many people from the other side of the divide mm. into the center as possible to understand one the responsibilities and, and and functions of the military how the military look at issues and then for the military to also understand the way the civil populace look at issues uh, when you talk about security security and insecurity are uh, two sides of the same coin you want to secure something somebody is aggrieved Somebody is, 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 is believe he's being marginalized and will react to it. So we all of us need to understand ourselves. And a major, major factor is the fact that we're still living in the past. People still believe, yeah, the military has been there, they have nothing to do, this and that. Yes, we need to start building trust. We need to start relating. Without trust, it is going to be very, very difficult for anything to be achieved. There are three Ds involved, democracy itself, dividend, and deficit. We must plan ahead because everything will not be rosy. It's not going to be, to be fine every time. There will be instances where there will be problems. Demonstrations, protests are part of a democratic uh, uh, platform. In your description, those are the deficits of democracy. They, those are the deficits. You must, plan, you must plan for those things. You can't have dividends, everything being rosy every time. It is because we don't plan and we don't understand ourselves. And that's why we always have this belief that, look, these guys are not, they are not in support. It's, it shouldn't be like that. We should all look at what is the national interest, what do we want Nigeria to be, and we should work towards it, rather than being antagonistic to each other at every time. One of the things the conference I was talking about, the, or this particular course I was mm -hmm. talking about, raised a question about for. Uh, um, tackling, in uh, tackling national security challenges, mm. all stakeholders in the security sector mm. need to understand their individual roles mm. as well as the roles of the other parties. How strong are these position even three years on from this particular course? Mm. I know you were not there. We, we've done, we've done two, two additional courses of this. The leadership Nature. is now an annual thing. Mm. So leadership in national yeah, security. Because three was done. Uh, last year, we could, we've not been able to do course four. Okay. We've turned it to a course now. Okay. Yes, you see, the, the, the problem is anywhere in the world, you have people trying to build empires. And we've realized that in Nigeria, everybody will operate in silos. This is my top, this is my area. I cannot afford it to come and take sh the shine of me. It shouldn't be. It shouldn't be like that. And so we. What we are, we've been advocating at the center is we must find a way of having better coordination of everybody's activities. If all those who are involved, including civilians, if their activities are well coordinated, you will have achieved so much. It will assist you in bringing better cooperation amongst them. Implementation has always been an issue for us as a nation. So how much of such have been developed 
for the advancement of society from here? We've, we've done a lot. Uh, you see, it's like I said, for the military, it's easy for me to speak for the military because this is what you need to do and you follow through. But I, we don't have control. I, I can only send my report, for instance, to the police and the ID or the office of the ID will respond. Thank you, you received your report. We are working on it. How far they worked on it? I cannot ask. I cannot query that. I cannot question that. Mm -hmm. Perhaps that's where the issue of that coordination that you talked now about comes in. So somebody, push. somebody somewhere needs to be able to say, look, we received this report. And that's why on most occasions, we usually, if not 100% of the time, invite Office of the National Security Advisor. Okay. Please send somebody to be here mm -hmm. so that from there you can take it over and find a way of okay. getting people to All do right. this. Uh, I'm still going to come back to that area of the hybrid warfare mm. you talked about for mm. us to see how we can channel what we have, mm. even though you're not divulging everything right here upon, on public space. Uh, the center too has a mini museum, I know. Yeah. And um, tell us about what is happening there and how much of it is known to the public. Uh, the, actually, the, the old building, mm. The, we call it ML Aguay Block. It was supposed to be the Nigerian Army Museum. Okay. It was constructed in 2006, but it was never occupied. The museum was then, up to now, majority of the items came from Zaria. Okay. So we have the museum that tells, if you come to the museum, right from the ground floor to the top floor, tells you the story of Nigerian Army, and by implication Nigeria, because the development, the civil war, all the operations we've conducted up till Boko Haram is you, to the third floor. You follow through and you see all those who are involved and what you've lost, what you've gained. It's an eye-opener. And that was why we made the center open to the public, so that the public will understand. These guys are not, uh, they are not there just to oppress anybody. But whatever they do is in trust. And that is why I said trust. There isn't trust. If you don't have trust, then the hybrid operation that I was talking about they will become very, very easy to conduct in Nigeria. The person who's conducting an hybrid operation will not come to your country. Uh, the computers are there. You have young guys who are, who are digitally savvy. savvy. They can do anything. They can. You have radio, radio, radio systems being coming up online. All of a sudden, a lot of things happening. Messages being passed. It is part of the hybrid warfare. You don't need to put your footprint. You don't need to go to another country. What you want to do is to disorient and disorganize the system. And once you disorient and you disorganize, the system will collapse. And once the system collapses, mm. stories of, oh, a failing state or a failed state comes in. Quickly, that's a question I must ask. I know the research is true, is on for everything that has been happening. Mm. I still go back to the insurgents and um, what they've done to the psyche of people, what they've done to the psyche of the military fighting them. Mm. How do you handle all of that for them to be properly uh, debriefed of whatever they've seen on the war front and also in relationship with their families and the society? We've talked about the issue of post military trauma mm. experience. Let, 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 let's share what you found out and how it's been helping. Uh, Whatever you do in the military, mm. uh, you, you are likely to be stressed, irrespective of whether you face battle somewhere or you are somewhere, because the military is a system that works on, the, you train from past experiences towards something that is unknown. You don't know what you are going to face, but you use your experiences of what really happened in the past to determine what you are going to do about it. And, it's not, it's, not, it's not something new. That's the normal thing globally. But then the society itself must believe in what you're doing. And that's where the problem comes in Nigeria. So if those you're actually doing this thing for don't really believe in what you're doing or don't trust you or start question what you do, another layer of stress is created. So over time, is the military believing that Nigeria doesn't trust it to, to, to help out in national security? Uh, no, no, no. What I'm saying is, if you send a military man out... I understand. I'm just and, asking and, that. And uh, the information that is supposed to be flowing is not flowing, then it means the trust is not full, it's not complete, it's not absolute. So perhaps that is another area the center needs to look into. 
Yeah, it's part of what we're doing. The Free trust is not full. The trust is not full. And like I said, we're still living in the past. We need to break that jinx of, look, it is not an army occupation. If somebody is sent out to you, please, you need to assist. Because insurgency, uh, whatever, whatever name you call it, the people you are dealing with, or the military and the other security agencies are dealing with, live within the society. That's where the problem comes from. It's not like the normal warfare where the two parties are known. And you can actually say, okay, somebody wants to educate between the warring faction and say you cannot go beyond this. It's an unknown enemy. The man will pray with you. Major General Agarabai, your date you will have. Director General, Nigerian Army Resource Center, thank you very much for coming on the spot. Thank you very Appreciate much. Appreciate your insight. Thank you so much. keep up the good work of getting us to know more about the military and what it's doing in terms of training and also being in charge of security generally. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. We also appreciate your time with us on the spot today. Let's do it again on the next edition and it will be with another interesting guest. Thank you for watching. My name is Blessing Abu. Goodbye.